started looking at the last section of chapter 2 that covers verses 6 through verse 22 of Isaiah. And the, this section can be titled, The Day of the Lord. Uh, it is a day of judgment that he's dealing with. Uh, and Isaiah sets forth the aspect that uh, God has forsaken the people because of their sins and their wickedness, because they had adopted the paganism and the superstitious ways of the foreigners. They had, verse 7, accumulated great wealth. And uh, then, verse 8, uh, they, the land was overflowing with idols. Uh, which they had made with their own hands. And verse 9, all men were bowing down to them. Uh, and so Isaiah does not even intercede on their behalf, but prays to God for a just punishment to be meted out against them or to them. In verse 10, there is a little transition uh, that is made. The people, in verse 10, are encouraged to seek hiding place from the justice of God. That justice of God is coming, and so he is basically telling them to enter in the, into the rocks and hide uh, because of the fear of the Lord course, that is an impossible task. You cannot hide from God. Uh, I think Jonah teaches us a good lesson along that line as well. But Isaiah here is impressing upon them the terribleness, the awfulness of the coming judgment upon them, that day of the Lord. And that gets us down to verse 11 where we end at our study last time, uh, where he talks about now the lofty looks of men shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So in this day of judgment, because that's what he's dealing with now, now uh, in which they are to try and hide from this judgment uh, and the fear of the Lord, the glory of His majesty, verse 10, in that day now, they're going to be humiliated. Uh, their arrogance is going to be brought down, and only God would be exalted. Uh, Solomon spoke a great deal about arrogance and pride, didn't they, in the book of Proverbs, uh, that it goes before destruction and a fall, for example. Uh, and you can probably remember several other comments regarding the aspect of pride, arrogance. Well, Isaiah in this is saying that's going to be brought down. It's going to be destroyed or uh, brought low. Um, and the Lord alone, God is the one who's going to be exalted in that day. Going to see his justice, his greatness, his majesty even though it is a day of destruction, you're going to see His majesty, His greatness. God is the one bringing this justice upon them. Uh, so, this becomes now an introduction 
to the rest of this section down through verse 22. And the day of the Lord, or that day as put it here, is a reference to the coming judgment. And Isaiah in this, the rest of this section is going to be showing how complete the judgment is going to be. It is going to be a total devastation, a total destruction. Uh, in which the arrogant are, is going to be brought low or they're going to be destroyed or crushed. So that's, that's the idea that he is setting forth in the rest of this section. Um, starting in verse 13, uh, then... Well, that's actually verse 12 that we were talking about. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. So there's that introduction of the day of the Lord, and that it is going to be a day of destroying the, those who are proud. Uh, It is true that in his later stages of life, Billy Graham did basically teach that, or he taught that uh, someone, that the Buddhist or the Muslim or all of these others would go to God in their own way, that there were thus several ways to God. Um, I don't think in his younger life he would have said those things, but maybe a combination of age and societal changes uh, brought about the changes in what he said. Uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting. Uh, his son, Franklin Graham, uh, what's he going to say in regards to those matters? Uh, of course, uh, Billy Graham came under great attacks, even in regards, even though he was supposedly so great and everything, uh, he came under attack for saying things like that. Uh, and, you know, if you, since you got me off subject a little bit, uh, if you can go to God in these different ways and through these different avenues from a doctrinal standpoint, what's the difference in going to God differently as far as doctrine or if you get over into morals? Why can't you go to God using different morality? Uh, see, one of, the, uh, one of the things that has contributed to the immorality of our society is denominationalism. Basically, denominationalism has stated that you go your way, I'll go my way, even though we don't agree on these matters of doctrine, and we'll still both go to heaven. If you can disagree doctrinally, then why can't you disagree morally and still arrive at the same place? If one is true, then the other has to be equally true. There's still only one way. Um, 
and that's morally or doctrinally, it doesn't matter. Uh, but when denominationalism started this, that you know we're all going to the same place just by a different way, then why doesn't that, and the logical conclusion to that is that's true in regards to morals as well. Now then, when you see that aspect, you can start understanding a little bit as to why these religious groups have started accepting, for example, homosexuality. Why? Because they accepted doctrinal differences and then if you accept doctrinal differences, then you must, to be consistent, accept moral differences. And when you accept moral differences, where do you stop? Well, there is no stopping point. Uh, Carl. That's what I was going to say. Is once you leave the way, what makes a difference? What way you go? Yeah. And that's the whole point. Uh, they don't make any di distinction. Um, they, they tried to make a distinction to begin with. As long as you believe that Jesus is God's son. But in reality, if you don't believe in what he says and that there can be differences regarding that, then why can't there be differences in regarding who he is? If you can say there's differences and it doesn't matter as to what he says, then what difference does it make as to who he is? And if it doesn't matter in regards to who he is, then eventually it gets on to morality as to what he taught Morally. But you can be the most moral, moral person in the world and still be lost, correct? Yes. Now, they, Morals are not going to save anyone. Now, when you look at morals and you look at doctrine, yeah. if you don't have the doctrine, you're lost. Yes. Morals, but if you don't have the doctrine, then not having the doctrine leads to morals, is the point. You cannot, you cannot really, and here's, getting off on another subject on this, uh, the atheists, for example, they complain that religious people will shun them because of the moral questions. And they will argue, well, we're moral people just like you are. They might be. But the problem is they have no basis for their morals. It's simply because they want to live that way. There's no basis, though, upon living that way as to why they should live that way. If God doesn't exist, why should you live a moral life? It, there's no reason to. There's no basis for morals if you take away God. And that's the point that they don't realize. Well, the same thing in relationship to denominational people. When you accept that you can go any way from a doctrinal standpoint, then you have no basis for morals. What makes, for example, homosexuality wrong? Because God set forth a morality that says that it's wrong. Both from the standpoint of creation, but also his word. If you have rejected his word in one area and said it doesn't matter, then why not in relationship to that area? And that's why these religious groups today are starting to accept homosexuality. It has become, it didn't get there overnight. You know, how long ago did they start with this, we're all going to the same place just by different ways? 
I, what's that been going on? A uh, hundred, two hundred years, more? So it took time to make that transition from doctrine to morals, but it was the natural reaction to the aspect of doctrine. You cannot have correct living if you don't have correct teaching. And that's the whole point in regards to that. Okay, Dale, you want... Okay. Now, and since you got me off on that tangent, Paul, it's all your fault that we won't get very far tonight. <laughs> uh, but here, the arrogant, the proud, the lofty, everyone that's going to be lifted up, well, they're going to be brought low. They're going to be destroyed or crushed. Starting in verse 13 then, he's going to list five things in verses 13 through 18 that will be crushed or destroyed. And these five things that he's going to go through all of these things are things in which Israel had come to trust in and that led them to a rejection of God. That's the reason that they must be destroyed. Because these things, Israel now trusts, and it causes them to leave trust in God. The first one, Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, upon all the oaks of Bashan. So the cedars of Lebanon and the oaks of Bashan. Uh, some have stated that this deals with the image of haughty nobles and princes. You might say they're leaders. Uh, And the oaks of Bashan, some have stated that that uh, is the area east of the Jordan and famous for its oaks, pasture, and cattle. And thus, perhaps, the oaks there is a reference to idolatry. Uh, now then... I say possibly on these things we don't know for certain on, in every respect as to what he has reference to. Uh, but he's using something that would be very familiar with, to them. They're going to know. Uh, I remember that, this, that Isaiah was not written f for us or to us. It was written to them. They're going to know what these things stand for, whether we do or not. Um, verse 14 then. Oops. <laughs> and upon every high or upon all the high mountains and upon the, all the hills that are lifted up. So now then you have the high mountains and hills. Uh, as you read through the period of the kings and the divided kingdom, you often will read about the high places. The high places were, were areas or places that were higher in elevation because there was this thinking, if we can get higher up, then we're closer to God somehow. And these high places were where sacrifices were being made, unlawfully, we might say. As, um, and so this might be dealing with these high, lofty areas uh, or the hills that are lifted up, having reference to these sacrifices that are being made that would be oftentimes referred to as the high places. Um, 
in verse 15, and upon every high tower and upon every fenced wall. Uh, so here's the lofty towers, the fortified walls that are dealing with. Uh, the towers were often made on the walls of the city. Uh, they would have a tower built. You'd have a little wall, and the walls that you're dealing with during this period of time were not walls like we think of, like, uh, you know, the walls of our building here. These were massive, usually wider than the roads that we drive on. Uh, like, kind of like the Wall of China, except built up higher. Uh, but then every so many feet or so, you would have a tower that would be built so that they could have a watchman in that tower who would be looking out over the area to see if, somebody, if the enemy was coming. So here's your fortified walls, your lofty towers. They're going to be able to see the enemy afar off. Uh, many of the cities of that time frame, because of the fortified walls that they had, the towers that they had, they felt invincible. Nobody can take us. Um, and they would all learn differently, of course, but uh, at that time... You know, you come up against a wall that's uh, maybe 40, 60, 80 feet thick. How are you going to take that? If you just run up and try and take it, they're going to be shooting arrows and things, and you're going to die before you get there. They would be doing some of that. There's many ways in which to defend it when you don't have, you know, Remember, they didn't have the airplanes and jets then to fly over and drop a bomb. Um, those things hadn't been invented yet. So what did they do? Well, the way in which they captured cities was how? Generally, the way in which they took a city was to encamp against it to prevent any water going in. They could not get food, and they would starve a people out. That's how they did it. That way they that, saved life that way. Well, <laughs> that's the way in which they took a city. It might take years, um, but that's the way in which it was done. If you don't have water and food, if you haven't stored it up, now there's going to be, of course, certain places where they've stored it up, but uh, it's at some point in time, it runs out. Uh, think about uh, the way in which... Uh, Jerusalem was taken. Think about the way Samaria w was taken. It was basically by that method. Uh, so people came to trust in their walled cities uh, that nobody can come and destroy us because we're too well fortified. Verse 16 then, and upon all the ships of Tarsus, Tarsus, and upon all pleasant pictures. The idea here, these are ships, 
and it uh, could be either for commerce or for pleasure. Uh, the ships of Tarshish became a phrase for all things that minister to man's luxury. So if it appealed to the luxury of man, it was referred to in that way. Well, there's a great deal in Isaiah that is uh, used in the New Testament, referred to in the New Testament. Uh, the pleasant pictures, again, deals with all that is luxurious. Now then, we've already, in last week, we noted the fact that uh, they had all of these things that were rich and uh, the dangers of those riches. Well, now then, when he says here, this fifth point, the loftiness and haughtiness, or the, no, the fourth point, the ships for commerce and pleasure, all things dealing with man's luxury, uh, that those things are going to be destroyed because it does draw us away from God. <laughs> but but you had still the luxury that that is for the Russian Orthodox. Uh, it's it came to be very luxurious in all of those aspects. Well, look at the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> yes. Uh, Instead of pleasant yeah, pictures. Imagery. The Hebrew is pictures of desire. So anything that would appeal to those things and uh, is what it's dealing with. Yeah, more than we can afford. Uh, if we sold our house and everything else, we we couldn't even buy them uh, because they're so expensive. And that's what people take pride in. That's exactly what he's talking about. Instead of going to God and trusting Him, they're trusting their riches. Okay, Dale. Okay, but here it's uh, the picture is setting forth of desires and luxury. Uh, that those things are going to be brought down. And then in verse 17, the fifth picture that he sets forth, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, the haughtiness of men shall be made low, as the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So here's the loftiness of man. Uh, and this is basically a, a repetition from verse 11. Uh, that basically says the same thing in regards to the lofty looks of man. Uh, so there you have the lofty looks. And here just the loftiness of man shall be humbled, bowed down. 
the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down here. The haughtiness of men shall be made low. And then the added phrase, the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, verse 11. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, verse 17. So it is basically a repetition of verse uh, 11 in regards to what he's saying here. Um, <laughs> okay, Mussolini. Uh, there's probably been a lot of those leaders through the years who had that same type of look. And you, you can tell it uh, with a lot of people that they just look down at their nose upon everyone else. They're, they think that they're better than everyone else. Uh, so that is going to be brought down uh, and again our Lord will be exalted in that day of the Lord man being destroyed and he alone shall be exalted uh, now then wouldn't it have been better for Israel if they had exalted the Lord throughout that entire period? <laughs> if they, they would not have had to undergone all of this destruction, being brought down and destroyed, going into captivity, and all of those other things that they had to endure, if they had exalted God throughout their, peer, their time of praying their, as a nation. But they didn't. They left him to trust in other things. So verse 18. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. There's going to be, he says, an utter destruction of idolatry. Now, as you go through that period of the divided kingdom, and all of the kings, both of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, you will find repeatedly idolatry being brought in to the nation and the nation going after idolatry. Isaiah has mentioned it uh, in these first couple of chapters, and he will a num numerous other times. But there's that continual idolatry that we see. Isaiah is prophesying of a time in which it's going to be utterly abolished, and it was. After Israel is returned from Babylonian captivity. Now again, when we are dealing with, you're dealing with two nations here, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is referred to as Israel, also referred to many times as Ephraim. And then the southern kingdom, which is referred to as Judah. After the southern kingdom goes into Babylonian captivity. The northern kingdom has already been taken away at 722 B.C. into Assyrian captivity. 586, the, north, the southern kingdom of Judah is taken into Babylonian captivity. In 536, Cyrus the Great allows Israel to return home and to rebuild first the temple and then the walls, and the, or the city and the walls. When, or after that return from Babylonian captivity, there is no record of Israel going after idolatry again. It was, as Isaiah says here, utterly abolished. It was destroyed totally as far as Israel is concerned. Whereas before, continual times of going into idolatry, now then, 
never again. So that's how utterly abolished the idolatry is. Uh, and I guess even to today, you don't really see Israel going in after I the idols of nations. Um, you might see, you know, mental idolatry, as we might, as I might term it, uh, that we face even today. But as far as these false gods, you just don't see it. it does not happen. Verses 19 through verse 21 then is going to show the effect of the day of the Lord would have on the people. In verse 19, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So they're going to flee to the caves and the rocks in terror of the Lord. Going to try and seek shelter in those areas from this destruction that God is bringing upon them. Um, this also is a figure that is used in Revelation. Uh, that they would go into the rocks and the hills and say, fall on us and hide us from the, the terrible day of the Lord. They're probably in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. But uh, you see the same type of figures being used. Uh, the earth shaking is a symbol of God's awesome presence. Someone turn over to 2 Samuel 22 and read verse 8 for us. 2 Samuel 22 and verse 8. Okay, here God is wroth, and so what? All of these shake, they tremble because of his presence. Second, Second Samuel 22, 8. Uh, someone turn over to Habakkuk chapter 3 and read verses 6 through 10 for us. Habakkuk 3, 6 through 10. Okay, here's the mountains seeing God, for example. And what do they do? They tremble. They shake. Um, and so that entire section is dealing with the, that same type of aspect of here's the nature, the rocks, the mountains. They tremble at God's presence. 
We also see that in relationship to severe judgment. Uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter and verse 26. Um, someone read that. Okay. And again, if you go back into the context of Hebrews 12, verse 26, you're dealing with judgment of God. That he is not only going to shake the earth, but also heaven. Uh, but there in regards to severe judgment against people, those who reject God. The, Um, yeah, he, he does go back, and, and the basis of that is found in Exodus 19, in which he, uh, prior to speaking to the people, the mountain shakes, the earth trembles. Uh, so now then, he's not only going to shake the earth, but also heaven. Uh, in verse 20 then, in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. <laughs> Notice idols of silver, idols of gold. Uh, would you think that those things would be rather expensive, worth a lot of money? Those are, you know, even today, precious uh, metals that cost a great deal of money. Uh, I don't know what one ounce of gold costs nowadays. Uh, it fluctuates so greatly. 1300 Okay. Uh Silver is not nearly as expensive, but it's still costly. Well, notice he, they're going to cast these idols of silver and gold to the moles and to the bats. What's he saying? They have no value now. They're worthless to him. Precious metals, yes worth money-wise a great deal of money, but they are now worthless. Very quickly, Dale. Uh, in Proverbs 1, 22 through the end of the chapter, he talks about how you, you can procrastinate for too long when the time will come, and you, you won't answer or show any positive response, and, and you let things go too long. In the caves and in holes, and so, in other words, they don't think too much about it. Why didn't they just melt it down and, you know, keep the riches of them? Because <clears throat> that would not have shown the, the disrespect and worthlessness of those things, those idols. This does. They're just saying these things are worth nothing to us. They are as trash. We will start with verse 21 then, Lord willing, next week.